Welcome to the Tuesday edition of the DC Today. I uh, am going to pretty much spend all of our time today just focused on one thing, and that was today's market action in response to the CPI uh, number for November that came out today. Um, CPI being, of course, the consumer price index that, uh, you know, quite uh, structurally flawed, but nevertheless consistent metric used by so many to measure price inflation. Um, The Fed, the Federal Open Market Committee, will announce their interest rate decision tomorrow, Wednesday the 14th. Uh, You're sitting at about a 79, almost 80% chance of a 50 basis point rate hike, which to me is, at this stage of the game, pretty close to 100%. Um, it, It is odd that it's not all the way there, Um, yet it sure seems that with market expectations so fully priced at a half a point rate hike tomorrow versus three quarters, you would think that um, if that was not the case, that the Fed would be correcting it with some sort of guidance or messaging. But be that as it may, we'll get that announcement tomorrow. The last several uh, times that the Fed's had an announcement Um, I think there was one of the last three times that there was a major market rally. There were uh, two times that there was a major market sell-off, and one or two of those times included a a rally followed by a sell-off, so a whole bunch of volatility in the 30 to 60 minutes that came after the announcement. So any of those things are possible, and of course it could even be a big uh, dud tomorrow but we haven't had a dud in a while. We've had upside, we've had downside, we've had up and downside volatility immediately after, not necessarily um, a dud. Here's a little theory of mine that I think is reasonably um, defensible as to why you may not have a huge spike in volatility. I've argued all year that most of these immediate moves, meaning the day of a Fed announcement, have been um, very, very short-term traders that get uh, pulled one way or the other when the news, you know, is kind of the opposite of what they may have been uh, hedged for or, or positioned for. And today, um, I got back from New York City and was walking into my house at 2.30 in the morning. And at 5 o'clock this morning when I got up after just a, a short stint of sleep, the futures were up 500 points and the CPI number had just come. And by the time the coffee was made, the futures were up 700. And by the time the coffee was uh, consumed, the futures were up 830 points. The market opened up 707, and then it never ticked higher from there. The peak of the day was the very first print. And markets then um, went down steadily throughout the day. Then at one point actually went negative on the Dow, and then it did uh, close up a little bit over 100 points. The exact number was 103 points, 104. That was uh, 30 basis points of upside on the Dow. But again, that came after being up 800 points this morning in the futures. The S&P was up 73 basis points, 0.73%, and the NASDAQ was up right at 1%. Bonds rallied again. The 10-year was down 11 basis points. We're back down to that 3.5% level. Um, The top performing sector was real estate, up over 2%. That's a rate-sensitive market. Energy was up 1.77%, continues to be holding in extremely well with oil in the 70s versus the 80s. Um, The only negative sector was consumer staples, which was down just 0.17%. So even though the total numbers were well off of highs, overall, broadly speaking, it was a pretty good day. So I want to get to some of the actual numbers um, from the CPI read in, the, in, the, in a moment. But I want to explain kind of what, why I believe that some of the short-term trading that would normally be happening tomorrow might have happened today. Now, don't get me wrong. It's entirely possible that you end up getting something in the Fed announcement that spikes volatility to the upside or downside tomorrow. And it's also entirely possible that you don't get much of a reaction at the announcement. And then Powell says something in the presser. You know, he's been doing these press conferences after the announcement, and you can get any number of movements around those things. But if I'm right on my year-long theory that a lot of the volatility around these types of things have to do with the fact that if there's a big 
blowout CPI number that is to the upside on inflation, there's a whole lot of people positioned for something the opposite and then vice versa. And I don't think there are a lot of people that were betting on a lower than expected CPI number. I don't think there are a lot of people betting against it, but there were some because they, you know, there's a major amount of money to be made if you are guessing on the right side of an upside CPI and essentially bond yields going higher, equity prices and risk assets going lower. And so a number like today where the CPI number came in less than expected, inflation was to the, the lower end of expectations. So interest rates went lower, risk assets rallied. I don't think there's a very good reason that, I, and you know, this is kind of my life but there's plenty of things I don't know. And I don't, and I don't, I didn't hear any other theories today from people that I would consider their theories worth hearing as to why the market would have been up 800 points at all on this news and then why it would give it all away. And the best theory I have is that there were people positioned for the other side of CPI and they were covering uh, in the midst of getting their faces ripped off. And that covering doesn't take very long. It got done and then markets normalized. And, you know, look, you were up over 500 yesterday. You got another 100 today. It's a decent little rally, mostly offsetting some of the downside from the last couple of days last week. But nevertheless, still just thousands of points to the upside in equity markets. Since this theory has been baked in, it's a theory I hold to, that um, the Fed is ready to pause and that the inflation data that has been the rationale for Fed tightening has mostly played out. I think we're either our sixth or seventh month now of core goods disinflation. It's actually the second month of core goods deflation. Not just that the rate of inflation peaked back in the very early part of the year, which is a fact. It was the very month that I said, I think this is the peak, did prove to be that peak. But you still were getting more ongoing inflation in core goods. It's just that the rate of that inflation was dropping month over month. That's called disinflation. But now this month and last month, you actually had deflation uh, prices dropping. Core goods were down half of a percent month over month. Uh, so what is core goods? It's the element of prices being measured that are not related to services. And core means it's excluding food and energy. Energy prices were down 1.6% on the month. Um, so the headline number wouldn't have been much worse, although food prices were up half a percent, which was still less than it had been last, last month. So the key data point to me in all of this inflation data remains rents and owner's equivalent rent, which is three quarters of the shelter amount, which all in, put, all in total equals a third of the CPI number. And... Rent showed last month is up 0.7% on the month, 7.1% year over year. So if you, you know, if you believe that, I, I'll tell you another one, but it, it's something we've talked about a lot that most certainly in real time, rent numbers and housing prices are showing uh, in, in a deflationary mode. Um, and yet the way in which the owner's equivalent rent is measured, that lag, now they're catching up to it because this was the lowest in four months um, of the overall shelter inflation, but it's still, I think, behind reality. And uh, that is the largest contributor to the CPI numbers. So it's a big deal. So medical care costs were down half a percent on the month. That's the second month in a row. I already talked about food and energy. It was kind of a, a mixed bag. Um, but look, the core goods year over year inflation uh, is down is now up 3.7 percent. So that remains a little bit above the Fed's um, uh, target level, but it is literally more than half disinflated from what that peak level was. So that's where I think the services side is going. Services will be a little stickier and slower, and uh, the housing pause uh, in terms of lag effect will take a little longer. I don't, I think most of this is known. I'm glad that I don't have to update my projections yet again, because I have had to do that along the way. Uh, when, when you can be right on a call, but early on a call, it's the same thing as being wrong on a call. And I've done that many times in my career. But um, in this particular case, I still think that the major takeaway is not being able to predict what the CPI is doing. It's what the Fed's reaction around it will be 
And I stand by my theory. Right now, I'll tell you what futures are showing. Um, not only that we're going to get a half a point rate hike tomorrow, but then going into December, there's a 50% expectation of a 25, excuse me, going into the new year. February 1 is the date of their, point, of their next meeting. A quarter point rate hike um, at a 50% chance. And then there's a 40% chance of a um, half a point. And so it's a little bit more, you know, 50 to 40, the 10% that makes up the difference is spread out a few out of a number of different options. So I think that um, that's where we'll have to see as we go into the new year, what data points cause them to say, let's pause, let's do one more 25 point basis point, whatever. But I've never cared and I don't care now. Are you talking about 475 is where they stop? Are you talking about five is where they stop? Do they do it 25 twice? Do they do 50 once and then nothing more? I don't know. I, I don't know. It's in that range, 450 to 500. And the market seems to now agree with that. And then you do end up getting another question, which is, do they sit and pause for three months or do they um, sit and pause for six months? And is the next move a cut, which, which I, I, whatever point they do pause, I'm pretty darn confident the next move would be a cut, not a hike. But nevertheless, um, those are, are things we'll start talking about and hearing the media talk about into next year. For now, uh, this is what we're dealing with is the Fed meeting tomorrow and so forth. Uh, I'll leave it there. Clients are going to get their portfolio holdings report for the week, bright and early in the morning. Um, there's a couple links and there's definitely the, the standard Ask David uh, Q&A in, in the written DC Today. And other than that, Brian Seitel is going to bring you DC Today tomorrow as I will be out of the office and out of the office meetings all day. And so I want a real fresh, robust uh, Fed Day podcast from Brian. He'll bring that to you tomorrow and I'll be back with you Thursday and I'll be bringing you Dividend Cafe Friday. And that's where we are. Thanks for listening to and watching the DC Today. Thank you.